I, I don't know how she sings that fast. Let's just say that first. <laughs> that was fast. Praise God. Hello, everyone on Facebook who's watching us in the live stream. Blessings, blessings. Many of you are still soaking in from amazing teachings. We had lives from Only Love and Keisha last night. You can go into the units in Facebook if you all are hanging out in the portion and, and still watch those over in units. It's on unit four. So we're kind of kind of house them in there so you don't have to scroll through all of the you know, junk in Facebook. You can go straight into units. If you go to the main page on uh, the portion in that group and then jump in there and do that. Love all of you guys. Let's see some quick housekeeping before we want to give uh, Miss Halisa every minute. So let's see the music. I We are getting the best feedback about Rivka. We are so blessed. I know you'll be watching the replay. She's homeschooling right now, but thank you. Thank you for sharing your beautiful music with us throughout this conference and giving us permission to use your videos for the conference and all of you please connect with her she has just jumped into the portion so that so that way you can talk with her personally and tell her personally how much you love that let's see um inviting your friends y'all we noticed that a lot of you are inviting your friends into the portion when you do that we want to make sure you send don't just spam your friends please make sure you send them a little message and say we are inviting you to this and here's why and let them know we're going to be we ask them for their email and the reason is, reason is in the event of the if and when there is a Facebook apocalypse or we get shut down, we do have the email address. So we can send an email out and say, here's where we're meeting everyone. Here's the secret location. We're underground and here's where we can go to. You can still find us and we can find you. It's not so we can spam you or send you crazy sales pitches. It really is so we can keep in contact with you. And then another way, some of you noticed a post that says about the portion, if you wanted to get reminders about not just tonight, uh, each night this week in the Zoom link, but if you want to get reminded every Friday, because I don't know about you, but I have to have set reminders for everything lately. There's so much try vying for my attention. So if you text the phone number that's on that post and I'll, I'll put it in the comments here. Uh, someone, if they they will in the thread, jump in there and put the phone number. You text portion to that phone number. It's an 877 number on that post. What happens is we have your phone number. Again, the only purpose for that is to send you a reminder and give you the link so you can find it easy. Also, should there be a Facebook apocalypse or the internet should go down or something should happen, we can always text you and say, here's where we're at so we don't lose touch with you. And you don't lose touch with us. You have a connection. Let's see. The other thing a couple people have asked us, like, what the heck is, even is the Rooted Cafe? We've heard you say this. You know that we're sponsoring this conference. You can go to the rootedcafe.com and it's K-A-F-E, a cafe sort of combined. And the reason that we uh, have, if you go in there, look at the second little video, there's a little tour and that'll just tell you what it's about, where it's at and give you plenty of information there. I think that's it. Get your pen and your paper ready. Um, I have a whole fresh notebook for tonight, just saying. I'm going to pull. <laughs> oh, Halisa. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, I'm going to pull it by. I don't know what happened to my, my, my uh, introduction here. Let me grab it really fast. Uh, we did have one other thing we wanted to let people know is that anyone who is the conference special this month, if they're coming over to hang out with us, in the Rooted Cafe, they do get a free worship CD for this if they join us during the conference. If you hang out with us on the portion and every Friday we do a, a study, <clears throat> practical application, um, please never expect me to um, to share like Holisa does tonight. Uh, Brenda and I are sharing full practical applications like well, how do I actually do this every day in my home, in my life, with my family. So we, we're taking some of the things we learn and I, I am going through Holisa's courses. So I'm taking it and how I apply that to my life. I want you to know, all of you know that Brenda and I both are students of Holisa now. And so we are bringing her applications and showing you how we're walking it out as well. Well, tonight we are so blessed because Dr. Holisa Alwine, let me just impress you for a minute. She has a BS and her master's in education with Texas A&M and a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford Graduate School. Her area of research is in, is adult education with an emphasis on correctional education. Additionally, two of her three master's degree, one in rabbinic theology and one in religious education, emphasized research in Nazarene Judaism of the first century. 
Dr. Alwine was the recipient of the Oxford Grail Award for Distinction in Academic Research Quality, awarded by Oxford Faculty Senate 2007 for her dissertation, and her, I should have practiced this word, andragogical, and you're going to say it when you come on, andragogical methods of readiness for the correctional GED classroom. Her research was published in the Journal of Correctional Education, published by Correctional Education Associate, Association in 2010. Now she's retired from a career in federal law enforcement. Dr. Alwine writes, teaches extensively in the Jewish roots of faith. She is the author of Standing with Israel, a prayer of a house of prayer for all nations, the Creation Gospel Bible Study Workbook series, and she is a programmer on Hebraic Roots Network. Her newest project is publishing Becky books, books encouraging the kingdom of Yeshua, and she is joined in the project by some of her favorite lady authors and teachers. Proceeds from her Creation Gospel Workbook series have helped to build and provide monthly funds for the Lam Mala Children's Center in Kenya and assistance for, to orphanages and children's home in India, Peru, and Rwanda. Dr. Alwine is a student and a teacher of the word of God. I think that that is one of the my biggest things I love about you, Dr. Alwine, is how much of a student you are. I think that's my favorite thing. Thank you for that. Ladies, do know that anything that you have purchased, a per percentage of that does go towards uh, Dr. Alwine's orphanages to help they're in the process of tr getting a new building, some fun new things. Dr. Alwine, thank you. You have the floor. Blessings. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of stuff. I, I think it, when you were reading through that, I said, okay, we could have just summed that all up and said, she's old. <laughs> she is really old. <laughs> she's lived a long time. She did all that. Uh, but it's good to be with you guys tonight. This is what our second time together. And um, it's exciting to see this many ladies really diving in at different levels. But the great thing is, even if we're at different levels from somebody saying, what exactly is a Torah portion? To somebody wanting to parse a Hebrew verb, we can all fit in the same pool, guys. There's a shallow end, there's a deep end, and there's something in the middle. And I tend to like be obsessed with the diving board. But nevertheless, sometimes I do like to just chill in the, the shallow end of the pool. So that's the good thing about the, the word. You know, when you immerse in the word, there's all different levels based on where you are. So never, never allow anyone to make you feel dumb or uneducated or anything like that. It's, it's going to be a, a glorious kingdom, and we're going to have plenty of time to learn all those things. And I'm just going to apologize up front. I have a grumpy dog, but he would be even grumpier if I tried to lock him out of the room. So um, what I'd like to present tonight is a book that I'm working on. I, I have a book in the works on Esther. And while that's in the works, I thought, you know what, I think this is important there are so many hidden songs in the scripture. Now they're, they're evident in that we might know that it's called a song, but what we may not know about that song is what it has to do with the geography of Israel. We don't tend to think of the geography of Israel as having any special message. Like a mountain's a mountain, a river's a river, a lake's a lake, but it isn't, not in Israel. Even the very geography prophesies, especially as we find that geography in the Torah. And so going through these Torah portions week after week, it allows us the, the time to delve into the finer points of the Hebrew text and to notice things that appear odd, that appear out of place, that might seem to be inserted for no apparent reason, but if it's inserted for no apparent reason, then we're just compelled to find out, well, why is it there? Because it doesn't really look like it belongs there. And as we search through these, these Torah portions, what we found is that there are songs embedded in the, the very geography of the land of Israel. And we know that there are 10 songs 
um, that are important. There's several Hebrew words for song. And there's one particular word, which is shir or shira, which is where we get the song of songs or the song of Solomon, um, shir hashirim, the song of songs. There's so much prophecy embedded in that. It's, uh, it's telling us about the resurrection. But what I want to look at tonight is the, the song that runs through the land itself. And again, it's embedded in the stories. And you say, well, well how can prophet, prophecy be a story? Because we tend to think of prophecy as coming on the, the prophetic books, like Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. The thing is, they're getting the prophecy at second level. Moses was the one who received it first level. And that's what Adonai reminds Miriam and Aaron when they, they spoke against the Cushite woman. He said, look, when I speak to others, I speak to them in dreams, visions, and dark sayings. Moses, I talk to him face to face. It's full disclosure with Moses. And so we look at the five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, as being mostly stories or laws, depending on, you know, what we've been indoctrinated to believe. But for the most part, this is where we find the good Bible stories for kids. Well, yeah, it is good Bible stories for kids, but we tend to learn through story. And so the greatest prophecies of the Bible are embedded in its stories. And that's good news because I like stories. I like to read stories. I like to write stories. But the stories of the Bible are more than stories. They're prophecy at first level. And so when Jeremiah and the others prophesy, they're always pointing Israel back to these prophecies of the Torah. That's the foundation. And so that's what I want to do. I want to uncover a foundation for us. And it concerns a place called Beit El. I'm going to try to share my screen with you. And Beit El, we know, is where Jacob was when he sees, he wakes up, he realizes he's been in a very holy place. He said, you know, this, this is the gate of heaven. I didn't know it. How could I be sleeping here all night and not know it, not be aware of it? And he sees this ladder. He sees the angels ascending and descending on this ladder. So there's a special language that goes with that encounter. And the story of this encounter eventually is going to span all the way north, even beyond Israel's present day border. It'll extend just over the border into Lebanon, modern day Lebanon. And that prophecy is going to kind of spring up from there. It's going to flow down through the land itself, flow down through the Jordan River, flow down into the Dead Sea. And from there, he is going to teach us the story of resurrection embedded in the Torah, embedded in the stories, which is pretty awesome. So, these are the headwaters of the Galilee. There's four streams that come out right here at this waterfall. It's called the Barnes Falls. And this is in the, the north of Israel today. And you can go down there and just you're mesmerized by this. You can just stand there and watch it forever. It's so beautiful. But these are the waters that are going to then begin to flow down into the, the Galilee itself. And the Galilee really isn't a, a sea. It's not a sea of Galilee. It's more of a big lake. But you can see just how beautiful and clean these headwaters of the Galilee are. And it's awesome to stand there and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, the water that Yeshua walked on, that would have come through this channel right here. 
clean, beautiful. But we're going to take it even farther north than this geography. It's kind of loud, but it's kind of loud when you're standing there under it, too. Um, Jacob's encounter with the ladder at Beit El is going to take us even farther north in that beautiful waterfall. Like I said, it's going to take us all the way up into modern Lebanon over the border. And in Genesis 31, 13, Adonai identifies himself to Jacob. He said, I am the God. Or in English, it'll say Bethel. It's Beit El in Hebrew. Beit is house. El is God. So it's the house of God. He says, I am God of Beit El. For you anointed a pillar where you vowed a vow to me. So that's important. When Jacob had this encounter with the, the angels ascending and descending on the ladder, this experience was so profound that he anointed the stone where his head was and he vowed a vow. And the vow was pretty much, if you will give me clothes to wear and food to eat and bring me back here in peace to the land of my father, then I will pay my tithe. This is my vow. And so one of the sages, the Jewish sages, comments to this verse. And he says, uh, what is said here denotes promotion and eminence, like one um, anointed to be king. Similarly, it says, Jacob poured oil on top of the pillar for it to be anointed as an altar. So we have where he's sleeping here, anointed as an altar. Now, sadly, much later in Israelite history, this is also going to be the place where King Jeroboam set up an alternate altar to the one in Jerusalem. He erected a golden calf and he created a different calendar. And then he blocked the roads where the northern tribes of Israel couldn't go down into Judah and celebrate the feasts at the temple. So this is going to have a wonderful history. And then we're going to see in another generation, many hundreds of years later, we're going to see Jeroboam um, try to erase the, the effects of the prophecy that we see here. And so Jacob, he awakes from his sleep and he realizes what a wondrous place he's in. And we start to look for things in these Torah portions. And that's the principle of resurrection. When we say awoke from his sleep, sleep is going to be symbolic of death. And awakening is going to be symbolic of resurrection. So this encounter at Beit El is giving us kind of a GPS. What are we supposed to be seeing here? We're supposed to be seeing a prophecy of death and resurrection. And now we can understand, at least in Jacob's mind, when he wakes up and he says, oh, man, I did not realize what a wondrous place this was. He's had an experience that has helped him to understand a principle of death and resurrection. And in fact, when we look at the altar, that, that seems to be, have been important to him. There's a stone there. He pours out the oil on the altar. Um, we have in Revelation an allusion to the souls that are going to be under the altar. And they're, they're crying out, how long, O Lord? In other words, how long until the last soul comes in? Because they're understood to be stored under the altar, also under the throne. If, if you know the structure of how the throne is set up and then how the lower altar mirrored the altar above, then it, it all makes sense how that those who have already crossed over in death, the righteous, those souls are being stored, might, you know, maybe a more industrial type word, but they're resting. They're being collected under this altar. And so Jacob realizes he's in a pretty wondrous place. He's had a, 
a vision, a dream of resurrection. And he realizes its importance. And what he's doing is he's running away. Remember, he's uh, pretty much stolen the blessing from Esau, his brother. And so he has to leave. He has to run away because Esau has resolved to kill him. Now, he's also resolved he'll try to wait it out until his parents die. But apparently his anger was not abating one bit because his parents tell him, okay, Jacob, you're going to have to go uh, up to Haran and, and you're going to have to stay there until Esau's anger abates a little bit. Esau is also Edom, Edom. Um, another way of saying Edom is to say the red one. And he has this earthy image. Remember, he's, he's the earthy man. He's from the Adama. You can hear that in his name. Adama, earth. Adom, red. And so Esau is going to represent more of the soul than the spirit. Jacob is going to represent more the spiritual side of man. But Esau, he's called the red one. He's the, the son, he's the twin. And using twins here tells us how both of these have to really be in one body. And so using twins as an example, that's a great object lesson for us. Because inside of each one of us, there is a Jacob and there is an Esau. Esau represents the soul. Appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect. He's the firstborn. He represents the natural realm. And that's what Paul tells us in his letter. He says, it's the natural that's revealed first and then the spiritual. So Esau reveals to us the natural person, the soul. But Jacob represents to us the spiritual part of us. And the, the prophecy given to Rebecca was a reminder of the problem in Eden. That when the soul gets out ahead of the spirit, that the soul will disguise itself as the spirit. It's a deceiver. Because unless it is disciplined of the spirit, it's in no condition to drive the car, we might say. Because the spirit functions based on it is written. The spirit doesn't function based on I feel, I think, I want, I need. Yeshua demonstrated that to us when he was taken out into the wilderness to be tempted and how where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. What happens in that time of fasting? Your body finds out that your soul is not necessarily a liar, but your soul doesn't have the full view of things. Your soul, the animal soul that's in you, is put in you to keep you alive. Because if you don't feel or sense danger, you won't run away when a bigger animal attacks. If you don't eat, you will die. If you don't drink, you will die. If you don't reproduce, you will, you know, the species will die out. If you don't use your intellect, you won't probably be able to feed yourself or protect yourself. And so the soul, it has a specific function and it's not bad. It's not bad at all, but it was created in a human being to be subject to his spirit because the spirit is what is in the image of Elohim. And so in fasting and spiritual discipline, we gradually teach the soul, soul? <laughs> That's why in the Psalms, the soul is always being spoken to. The spirit has to tell the soul what to do. It'll say, um, be silent, oh my soul. Th that's when the spirit is telling the soul to shut up. Or if it says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, that's the spirit saying, now is the time to speak up. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. So it's learning to obey the spirit rather than running roughshod over the spirit and saying, because I felt something, the spirit must be there. Not necessarily. And, and so it's not easy. 
you know, once we fell out of the garden, it became very difficult to distinguish between which voice was speaking to us. But that's the, that's the prophecy of Esau and Jacob, that Esau is going to represent that impulsive, strong instinct to keep me alive. And it wants to drive the car all the time because it's there to keep you alive. But the spiritual side of you was created to have authority over the soul. Your Jacob was created to have authority over your Esau. And when that's in place, then we have harmony in one body. When those two things are struggling within you, like they were struggling with uh, Rebecca, it's a problem. But, you know, at least now we know what the the key code <laughs> to the gate is. So at Luz, we're told that Jacob renames this place um, Beit El. He renames it the house of God. And, and the text tells us that formerly this place was called Luz. And what does Luz mean? Well, we can do some interesting studies but in a nutshell, um, a loose bone is a, a tiny bone um, and at the base of your neck. And it's supposed to be such a, a tough bone that it's hard to even burn it and destroy it. And so it's seen as a resurrection bone. That's kind of the, the tradition surrounding what a loose is. So the place was called Luz, but Jacob renames it the house of God. And so Jacob is on a mission. He has to go out. He has to go out from the land in order to find a wife. He's seen the, the sorrow that his brother Esau, Edom, brought upon his parents because he married Hittites and they were idolaters. And because they were idolaters, they were just, you know, a daily um, friction within the family. So they were idolaters. And it's only when Esau sees that Jacob's being sent off to go find a holy wife <laughs> that he kind of smacks himself on the head and says, oh, yeah, okay. I wasn't supposed to run out there by myself and just, you know, take whatever wives I wanted. I should have consulted my parents because in that day and time, it was parents who arranged marriages. And Esau pretty much just supplants his father Isaac in that respect, uh, disregards. And it's only, it's like he's sorrowful, which we know a lot of people like that, right? They go out there, do what they want to do. They don't think, they act impulsively. And then they're like, oh, and they'll repent which is better than never repenting at all. But what we wish is they had a little more Jacob in their Esau. So that rather than having to repent all the time, that uh, they could have a more peaceful walk. And that's the description of, of Jacob. You know, he's a peaceful man. He lives among the tents. So the first marriage, if we take it back to the Garden of Eden, we know we had a loss of spiritual garments, and so they had to be given garments of skin. They were told that they would have difficulty obtaining their bread by the sweat of your brow. The woman was told there would be difficulty in childbirth. It would become a, a life-threatening event. And then they were exiled from that place, from the Garden of Eden. And the place in Hebrew is makom. Hamakom. And Jacob is experiencing each of these in some way. We know that his wife, Rachel, she had difficulty in conceiving. And she died in childbirth with Benjamin. We know how much Levan or Laban put him through in earning his bread. He just, he kept wage, changing his wages. Like you changed my wages 10 times. We know that he, for a time, lived in exile from the promised land. He had to live with um, 
<laughs> not so nice relatives. He had righteous wives, but he had to live among not so righteous relatives in exile until he returned. So I have here some photographs of Beit El, which was formerly Luz. Um, it's near I in scripture, if you've ever read that um, in the time of Joshua, it's very close. That's there on the left. And then Beth El or Beit El is there on the right. And you can see that, you know, over thousands of years, that particular location has been used quite a bit. But here's the, the problem with the Macomb or the place being Beth El. Because Beth El, where Jacob would have slept, is quite a ways from Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac and Isaac was self surrendering. This is Mount Moriah, which we later find out is the Temple Mount. This is going to be the location where the house of God is built in the time of King Solomon. But we're told in Genesis 28, 19, he called the name of that place Beit El. However, previously, the name of the city had been Luz, which means almond tree. So this is our dilemma. If the house of God is on Mount Moriah, then how can the house of God also be, I want to say around 18 miles away, north? of where the house of God is. Our hints are coming, whenever it's mentioned, it will say, well, it used to be loose. It used to be called loose, and that's our clue. That's what we have to follow up on. When we go to Judges 1.8, and we're reading about Joshua's conquest of the Holy Land, there's an implication here that Beit El was not Moriah. It's exactly where we think it is today. Because it talks about two different places being conquered. It says Judah had conquered Jerusalem, where the house of God is, Mount Moriah. It says with the edge of the sword, and they set the city on fire. And then as we slide on down to verse 22, it says, likewise, like Judah, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. The house of Joseph spied out Bethel, and then we're given this information again. You're like, what in the world's going on? It says now the name of the city was formerly Luz. And so let's see what's odd here about Luz. The spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, please show us the entrance to the city and we will treat you kindly. Right there, you should be scratching your head. If they saw him coming out of the city, then why do they need to know where the entrance of the city is? So it says he showed them the entrance to the city. They struck the city with the edge of the sword, just like Judah did in Jerusalem. But they let the man and all his family go free. The man went into the land of the Hittites. He went north and built a city and named it Luz, which is its name to this day. So that's in Judges 122 through 26. So the name Luz is what keeps popping up around Beit El. And once the house of Joseph conquers Beit El, like Judah did Jerusalem, Luz doesn't go away. It just relocates. It's not destroyed. It relocates. It goes north. And so it says, likewise, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel. So our question is, if the house of God was built in Jerusalem, is this text talking about a separate area that's called Bethel? Or does it mean that the house of Joseph also went up and some unnamed man helped them locate the entrance to the city? Which again is, would be odd because the scouts saw the man come out of the city. 
I mean, they shouldn't have needed to ask where the entrance was. They could have asked more tactical details, like how many gates are there? Is there an ill turn at the gate? How many soldiers? We don't hear those sorts of things. They say, just help us find the entrance. You're scratching your head like, well, why are you asking that? But the text doesn't tell us that the house of Joseph remained in Bethel. They conquered the city and then Luz is relocated. There's something going on here. There's too many loose ends. So when it says the house of Joseph went up against Bethel, we're being teased with the language where it says went up, that verb there is ya'alu. Ya'alu, and it means to go up. If you, if you know like a, a whole burnt offering in scripture, the actual word there is ola. And ola literally means to go up. It's a going up offering. It's a resurrection offering. It's giving you all sorts of resurrection information when it tells you about ola offerings. And so it says the house of Joseph went up against Beit El. There is a resurrection principle embedded within the language. So it may be that the words themselves are folding together two separate locations. And this is just what the rabbinic commentaries tell us. They tell us that Mount Moriah and Jerusalem was folded into Beit El so that Jacob could pray at this place of his father's sacrifice, which he'd already passed by on his journey. And in another case where this happened, they said that at Mount Sinai, this was the challah taken from Mount Moriah. It was like the bread, the holy bread taken from Mount Moriah, and it was taken and set down on Mount Sinai. Now, that's, that's kind of figurative language, but what they're trying to tell us is that in the world of our creator, space bending is not a big deal. Time bending is not a big deal. We tend to think it's a big deal because it, I won't say never happens to us. Strange things can happen. But in the time of the Bible, place bending was not that amazing. I want you to think of Philip. He's teaching the Ethiopian in his chariot and then bam, he's transported to a completely different location. And that's important to understand. In the world of the prophets, in a world where the spirit is moving, in a world where Jacob can see that this was the gates of heaven, it's not so fantastic to think that Mount Moriah and Beit El, the house of God, could have somehow been pushed together, that somehow the space was bent and folded together. So, uh, and if you remember, another example is Elijah. When Elisha saw Elijah go up in the chariot, the locals there started looking for Elijah. And Elisha said, well, you can look, but you won't find him because I saw him go up and they go and they look anyway, because they say he may have been like transported to the mountains. So in their world, apparently it just wasn't that big a deal for a prophet like Elijah to be picked up and moved from one location to another. And finally they come back, like we couldn't find him. And Ailey says like, yeah, I told you you wouldn't find him. You know, there's no space bending going on here. He's just crossed into the garden. That's the extent of the space bending that's going on. But the clue we keep getting as to what's happening here is that a place retains its name. Even though now it's something else, and, and we get an example, like in Genesis 14, 2 and 8, it'll say, you know, the city Bella, which is the later Zoar, you will see people change names, like Avram becomes Abraham, Sarai becomes Sarah. Same person, different name, same location or vicinity, 
different name. So we have to look at this as possibly a prophecy concerning the ability of the house of Joseph to do just like their brother Judah had done. They had gained entrance to Jerusalem. They had gained entrance in a preliminary way to the house of El, to Beit El, because that's where the temple would be built. When King Solomon dedicated the house, he was the first one who, who kind of nicknamed it the house. So we want to take a look here at where Luz is now. Because remember, we're told the man, whoever he was, he, he wasn't destroyed, he was spared. He just went and rebuilt the city and named it Luz. And if you look in the, the graphic there, the, the screenshot of the aerial view, you can see where, um, I'm, try, I'm trying to see how the border goes. Okay, there's that little yellow line there. But you can see just across the border from Israel, if you see where it says Nimrod Fortress National Park, that's going to be on the Israel side. Well, just on the other side of the border where that red pin is, you can see there's a little Arab village. And it'll say maybe Wazani. I'm not sure which of the graphics I used. But there's a little village in Lebanon, Lebanon named Louise just north of the Golan Heights. And it's on the banks of the Hasbani River. So its location, the location of Luz, Arabic Luez, it's uh, about a kilometer from the Wazani Spring. And that spring is the major source of the Hasbani River. And the Hasbani, you, we can see how the, the river moves and then it goes into the land of Israel and it becomes part of the Banias Falls, those four springs of the Galilee that I showed you in the video. So from this spring here in Lebanon, this tiny little spring, it flows into a little river. From that little stream or from that little river, it goes into the Banias Falls. From the Banias Falls, it flows into the Galilee. From the Galilee, it flows into the Jordan River. The Jordan River is from Yerad, which means to descend, to go down. The Jordan River goes down and it terminates in the Dead Sea. So you see where we're going now with the geography. Luz is identified as the resurrection bone of the human body. And so this, this little Luz bone, this little village of Luz, where the springs of the Galilee begin, that river is going to flow south, 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 until it reaches something that today is considered dead. But it won't always be dead, according to prophecy. Um, uh, that's a little bit better like I tried to zoom in on it and it just made it fuzzy. But you can at least see how close it is to the border of Israel and you can get a better idea of how tiny that little village is. It's just a little farming village. Um, now here are pictures of the Galilee, which is also called the Kinneret. And it's important to know that it's called the Kinneret, not just the Galilee because Kinneret comes from Kinor, which is a harp in scripture. Kinor is a harp. And that's why I put the, the graphic on the left-hand side with the overhead view. You can see that it is shaped like a biblical era harp. So if we think of the water as the move of the spirit, if we, we think of the water um, as showing the movement of life, then we see from that tiny little resurrection spring, it will flow through the harp of the Galilee. And a song will be played in the Galilee that is going to extend 
all the way down to the Dead Sea. It's going to be singing a song of resurrection. Um, so what Jacob saw at Luz was angels ascending and descending on a ladder at an entrance to heaven. That's important, descending. Remember how what I said the, the root word of the Jordan River is? It's Yarad, where we get Yarden for Jordan. It means to descend, to come down. And so all sorts of language should be rattling around in your head right now. Like the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And Jacob sees, he has a resurrection experience here at Luz, the place of the Luz bone, the resurrection bone. And he begins to understand not just how we will ascend, but how also heaven can descend. Ultimately, that's what's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be a, a time when a third temple is pure enough that the Jerusalem above can actually descend again and they will merge, they will be married once again because now the natural realm will be purified and a fit partner for the spiritual realm. They'll come together. So the descending river is part of that prophecy. And the approximate place uh, where the Jordan River is going to terminate into the, it's called the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea. Jericho is just on the other side. And that's the exact place where the Israelites were told to go in. Why? because the descending river, this descending experience of resurrection, they're going to be able to cross back over and to ascend. And so they have to cross right there at that point where you can see that the living waters that start so far north and they flow through the harp of the Galilee and they descend down through the Jordan and right there at the the termination point where it's going to empty into the Dead Sea, this is where the Israelites are going to cross. And they can see that they are making a crossing between life and death. It goes back to choose you this day whom you will serve. Do you want to experience the living waters that are descending? Then if you do, and you believe in those promises of resurrection, then they could also look to their left, see the Dead Sea, and realize that according to prophecy, that Dead Sea will rise to life. It's, it was a picture of their own experience. And so that's what happens. There's uh, that waterfall I showed you has four streams or four springs that you saw coming out of the waterfall. And according to the tradition, which is based on some passages in the Song of Songs, there's four rivers of Eden as it's described in Genesis 2. And what is thought to fill those four rivers of Eden is milk, honey, wine, and balsam. And each of those represents pretty much a stage of our growth. And, you know, even Yeshua said, in my father's house, there's, there's many rooms, there's many abodes. And where you are in the garden, you know, you might be in a milk place, a honey place, a wine place, or a balsam place, depending on uh, where your residence is. But the place to cross over here is Jericho. And in Hebrew, Jericho it's thought to be descended from a Canaanite word, reach, which you, if you know a little bit of Hebrew, that still sounds familiar. And it means fragrant. Other theories say, oh no, it, it originates from the Canaanite word for moon, yereach. But sometimes we have to learn to say, yes, 
because these languages are pretty much on the same branch of the tree. So yes, there is an association with Ureach in Jericho that, that could be connected to the, the lunar deity, a pagan idol, Yarich. Um, but what if it's Aricha, which means fragrant, and it also represents the Hebrew, Reach, which also is fragrance. And remember what one of the rivers of Eden is said to flow with? Balsam, with fragrance. And we're even told in Isaiah 11 that Messiah will judge with his sense of smell. It says, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of a quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. When you read that in Hebrew, it's telling you he's going to sniff out things with his sense of smell. And so as he's sniffing in this judgment process, uh, what we want him to smell in us is the fragrance of resurrection. We want to cross the Jericho. And from what we can tell in the Gospels, this same location is probably where John immersed Yeshua. And we know that Yeshua is not a normal human judge. He's not using natural eyes and ears. He's using this sense of smell to know which side of the Jordan you belong on. Um, and then later, under pressure apparently from Herod, John moves north toward the Galilee to immerse. And so he connects this lower place where the Dead Sea is to the upper place up where the harp is, where that, that music of resurrection is going to start flowing through. And this would likely be the place, this is most people's best guess, that this is where John immersed, um, you know, where it terminates Jericho, the Dead Sea. And you can see it's not a great, you know, to the natural eye, it doesn't look that wonderful. But remember, he says, Messiah will not judge by the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears with righteousness. He's going to sniff things out. What humans may see as muddy water, Messiah will sniff out obedience, which we would call faith. He's going to sniff out the balsam of good deeds that are following you into the garden. Like it says in Revelation, their good deeds follow after them. You're emitting a fragrance, not like this bulldog does. But when you do works of faith, when you are obedient to his word, then you emit a fragrance that Messiah can sniff out. And so you can see why Naaman wouldn't have wanted to immerse in the Jordan. He'd be like, no, that's a muddy river. That's a nasty river. I don't want to be immersed in there. I, any river in the world would be better than this. But he goes and in obedience, finally, he immerses in this river. And he finds out it's not the natural eye that matters when you cross over. It's the spiritual eye. And when he comes up, his flesh, it says it's like child's flesh. He, in this, this Gentile general, once he dipped seven times in the Jordan, he comes up and he got a foretaste that, ladies, I got to tell you, <laughs> it's hard not to envy him because he got to see his resurrection flesh. And I'm like, wow child's flesh. We're going to enter the kingdom as little children. So here's what's happening. We have a prophecy of a resurrection spirit that's going to flow from Luz, right over the border in Lebanon. It's going to flow through the harp of the, the Galilee. And from there, it's going to flow all the way down to the what would have been Dead Sea. And so Jeremiah 33, 10 says, thus says the Lord, yet again, there will be heard in this place of which you say it's a waste without a man, Adam, Adam, 
without beast, that is in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And of those who bring a thank offering into the house of the Lord, for I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were at first, says the Lord. So he's telling us the Garden of Eden. It was populated with man, with Adam, with inhabitants, with beasts, with a voice of joy and gladness, the voice of Adam and Eve, the bridegroom and the bride. And he's saying, even though this garden was left empty after sin, he says, I'm going to restore the fortunes of the land as they were at first. He wants to repopulate the garden with those who will be fruitful and multiply in the place, Hamakom, that's represented by Jerusalem below. And this is Yeshua's job. He is here to restore the bride to the garden so that once again, joy and gladness can be heard there as they were at first among the rivers of Eden. And that's what it says. Now a river ran out of Eden to give drink to the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. It gave drink to the garden. It says it ran out of Eden. And this is the understanding. There was a lower Eden that was created for Adam and Eve and humankind. And it was a mirror of an upper Eden, the Eden above. And like Yeshua said, we want to pray, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Restore it as it was at first. When the lower Eden, a realm that part of it we can't see anymore because it's been concealed from us, the spiritual aspect. So when we go to the land of Israel and we see the physical things, we look up because we know that place of the bride and the bridegroom, it's hovering just above us. And the day is coming when that realm will be open to us. Because if we can hear his word, then we can see his kingdom. He's preparing us. So John 737 says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, remember, that's what it said about the rivers of Eden. It gave drink to the whole garden. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua was not yet glorified. And so we can see this flow of waters in even the geography of Israel. Even the waters are prophesying of the living water. And the living water prophesies of the Holy Spirit, which we are to receive so that we can repopulate the Garden of Eden. And one of the rabbis remarks about what Jacob saw. He says, the angels Jacob saw going up and coming down were dancing on the ladder. And dancing is still an important part of marriage ceremonies in Ju Judaism. They were dancing for Jacob's journey. He's about to go into exile, but he's going to make a holy family in exile. Kind of sounds like us, doesn't it? And they were dancing for this plan to return and build a holy house, Beit El, on earth to bring his tithes and offerings. And so the rabbi says, whoever enjoys the wedding meal of a bridegroom and does not help him to rejoice transgresses against the five voices mentioned in the verse. The voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voice of those who shall say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts. And if one helps the bridegroom to rejoice, it is as if he restored one of the ruins 
of Jerusalem. So marrying a holy spouse, rejoicing with the bride and the bridegroom, those are counted as literal thank offerings brought at the temple in Jerusalem, which is just a mirror of Jerusalem above. And so, yes, it was the angel's ladder dance, but it was also the angel's latter day dance because it was prophecy. So now we understand why later in Genesis 48, three, Jacob says to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous. And so maybe what we saw right there with the angels dancing on the ladder in this encounter was the beginning and the end of Israel's holy marriage. And the good news is we get to be a part of that. That is just beautiful. There is, I won't make us all go through the chat, but all through the chat, I'll say, first of all, everyone is saying, I need a bottle of the muddy water for my skincare sessions, right? I need that for, <laughs> we want it for skincare session, but we do have Q and A for you. Are you up for taking some questions? Sure. So the first one I'm going to jump to is uh, from Mary and she says she's interested in Dr. Alwine's understanding of why the sense of scent odor fragrance is the preferred sense for Yah throughout the word. That's a good question. Uh, one commentary I read suggested that in the beginning, when Eve was looking at the fruit and she saw that it was good for food, um, whether she was already touching it or not, we're not really sure, but she says to the serpent, we're not even supposed to touch it. So you can almost see her thinking, I bet that feels good. You know, she's, she's using senses, but the sense of smell, she's not discerning. He, she's not using her, her judgment sniffer. And so in terms of that, the, the sniffer apparently is a better judge. Um, because you guys know if something stinks, no matter how good people tell you it tastes, you can't eat it. <laughs> you know, if it smells like vomit, don't tell me it's food. You know, but you see like, that in the okay. food shows, the food shows, they bring up that those fruit, that one fruit, and it's like putrefied fruit. And they're like, here, taste this. And everyone's vomiting before they can even taste it. Yeah, before it ever touches your tongue. You're like, you get the signal. This is not good for food. <laughs> even if it's kosher, it's not good for food. Um, so yeah, the, the, the corruption there in the senses, um, apparently didn't affect the sense of smell so much that somehow the sense of smell will, will get closer to telling you the truth. Because I know just from training, if I'm talking to somebody and I'm trying to figure out whether they're hiding something or lying to me, I can look for clues in their body. And you can, you can do a lot of things, but it's really hard when you go into a deceptive mode to do it completely because you can train your eyes to lie to me. And, and people do that a lot. They train their eyes to just disengage at a lie. So I don't look at your face when I think you might be deceiving me. I look at your feet because your feet will tell me way more than your eyes. It's harder to deceive the feet and make them cooperate with a lie or a misstatement um, if you're holding something back. And so it's, it's knowing how to sniff that out, I think, because the senses can be corrupted to cooperate with a lie. But how do you, how do you manipulate the nose? Unless you just put something, you replace it with something else that smells, you know, different 
you could disguise it, but it won't last forever. One of the ladies said it's really interesting that when you are, Ashley says it's interesting, similar when you're pregnant, that how hypersensitive your smell is, is when you are carrying a seed. I don't know if anyone else, your superpower is your nose. Sometimes I remember, yeah, my daughter, someone was cutting celery in back in the kitchen in the, at the uh, restaurant she worked at. She could smell them cutting celery. So, you know, you have superpower and that's just, it's just uh, one of the first thing that gets you before you catch everything else. It's the first thing that comes to you. There's a, a Kimberly says, um, when you were talking earlier, she made a note saying it's kind of like a formation of the infant in the womb in the early part of your presentation. The loose would move from one location into the next as the child is formed. Yeah. And I think with the reach, with the sniffer, it's because it has that same root as ruach, which is spirit, it's, it's harder to fool the spirit. Mm. You can fool the soul, you can fool the body, but fooling the spirit, you're on a different level. <laughs> right, when you say we got wind of you, I got, who, I got wind of you. <laughs> you can't fool the wind, you know, you can't fool that when that comes around. Uh, Kimberly says, uh, uh, so as the neural tube develops to the end becomes the beginning. And she was, it was just her being, ex exclamation points uh she was just talking about earlier when you were talking about that that has the neural tube develops the end now becomes the beginning as it turns back around um there was anonymous ask you you mentioned a uh, four things she or she put milk honey and then something and then balsam she wanted to know what number three was milk honey what was before balsam wine wine Mm -hmm. There you go. Anna wants to know how old was Jacob in Genesis 31, 13, towards the end of his life on earth? I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't, I, I thought mean, we, that's, that's a, that's a research question. Right, right. Um, Sorry, that we, I started reading out loud and then couldn't stop myself. Uh, let's see. Um, Only Love wants to know, is there a song for Jacob's Ladder that was traditionally sung? Is this the same song that is traditionally sung? Um, not that I know of, but you would sing it as a song. The, the Torah portions are all sung. They're all chanted. So if you wanted to know what would these verses sound like in a synagogue, you can you can learn that. You can listen to that and and see what it would have sounded like, um, or what it today what it sounds like. Just like the song of Moses, we don't really know what the tune was, but we can still hear the song because it's chanted every year in the synagogues when it's part of that tour portion. Mm. Very good. Yeah, the, Sharon says that I've been back to the smell. She says, I've been taught that the sense of smell is associated with discernment spiritually and that she would agree an extremely strong sense. Olfactory hallucinations are memory based and very profound. Yeah, a scent can take you across time and space. Oh, I smell the bad. smell of Nivea and I'm back to being a little kid coming in from the beach sunburned and my mom slathering me with Nivea. I don't know why that was the choice, but, and then, you know, you get out of the shower and you were slathered in Nivea and that smell still takes me back to there. Yeah. We yeah. have, uh, yeah. Like my mom, she used um, beautiful mm. uh, powder. And if I smell beautiful to this day, I think of her sitting in front of her, her dresser in front of the mirror, getting ready, mm. you know, for something and, and the scent of that beautiful um, you never forget it. No, no. My mom's was, was a youth do. So same Estee Lauder youth do same powder. She'd powder up sitting in her thing. Cla uh, we have Klasha Taylor. She says the descending and ascending you were talking about with Jerusalem. Is this the same that John spoke of in the book of revelations where he says, I, John saw new Jerusalem being descended down out of heaven. My best guess is yes. Um, because the understanding is when sin entered into the garden, that the, the lower garden withdrew. But now we're talking about realms, because we're talking about a realm 
we have never experienced, or if we did, we probably didn't know we were in it when we were there. We know people have had experiences where like, hmm, that sounds like they stepped into the garden for a second, but what's a second in the yeah. garden? So this realm, this spiritual realm, it lifts up a little out of sight. And the sages say that it's no higher than a dove would fly. And Messiah's palace is in this, said to be in this garden, and it's called the bird's nest. Mm. And so there's all sorts of things with Noah's dove, this journey that she makes. It's, they understand that when the dove makes the journey the first time, she couldn't quite access. And when she makes the journey the second time, she comes back with an olive leaf from the Garden of Eden. And that's mm. how Noah knows it's, it's okay. And then with the dove and Yeshua, he's immersed by John the Baptist. He comes up out of the water and it says the spirit descended in the form of a dove, which would make those at least Jewish onlookers think, oh my goodness, you know, the garden is right here. It's, it's right here. Because when you talk about the kingdom, you might talk about going up, Allah, like the Ola offering or Ya'alu to go up. But Yeshua also teaches it's important to remember it's also something you enter in. So we have an up orientation, but we also have an in, which is why the Yarden functions as both. It comes down, but you have to cross over. You have to enter in at this specific place. And so the, the deeper you get into the text, the, you know, it's like the more doors and gates and windows that open up for you to see it from a different perspective. Um, so yeah, once the, you know, Ezekiel talks about a third temple, whether that's literal, figurative, we don't know. I tend to think it's a literal temple that's going to be so pure. He says that even the, the bells of the horses are going to say holy to the Lord. And even your everyday person's eating vessels, they're going to be at a level of purity like those you would use in the temple in the city of Jerusalem. And so once it attains that level of purity, then once again, what we see now in the natural realm will be that fit mate so that the, the Jerusalem that really is just out of sight, if you've ever been to the Temple Mount, you know it's there. You're not distracted by what's on top of the Temple Mount right now. You know it's up there if you've ever been there to pray that that will descend, it says like the bride adorned for her husband, because now there's a purification place, Hamakom is reestablished to function the way that it was supposed to in the beginning. And, and we're invited to be part of that, which is good news. Oh, this is beautiful. Ginger shares with us that when her mom was dying, she kept talking about a beautiful garden that she could enter into, that she could just get, oh, I'm going to lose it that she could just get to the window that right out it was right outside her window she could just get to the window but up near the level of the ceiling she described it many times in great detail and always reaching out to try and touch it That's yeah beautiful. That, there's lots of depth experiences like that for people who are ready to cross over or near to crossing over they'll look up like up at the ceiling of the room which is, is kind of the level we're talking about. Um, the chariots, if we look at the, the chariots that transport you into the garden, um, in the time of Elisha, remember his servant saw the chariots of fire in the mountains. And then when Elijah crosses over and Elisha sees Elijah in the chariot, he says, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. He can see them. And that's what Elijah said. You have to see it if you want the mantle. You've got to be able to see where I'm going. And it wasn't that far away. And, and that's when they're looking for him, they're looking in the mountains. They're looking in physical mountains, but he, you, you can't see him where he went. And, and that gives you, I think, a better sense of how close the kingdom actually is. Like, he's not out in another galaxy. 
um, is close. Oh my goodness. I, we have a few more things about the smell. We have, uh, I don't know who it is, they're anonymous. It says the sense of smell is thought to be the most primary, typically the first to develop and the last that we lose. It's interesting, Holisa, with COVID, isn't it interesting that one of the things that it is attacking is a sense of smell? I mean, I, 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 as a nurse, have never one time asked one of my patients, have you lost your sense of smell with, with any flu, with with any disease process, not once have, I, well, maybe with a stroke, but I have, other than that, so it tells me about the neurological issues here, but it's interesting how that is the, one of the things they're saying, have you lost your sense of smell? And I know um, there's a few on, on here that I've spoken to personally, and they'll say, oh, I tested positive for COVID, or I haven't been tested. However, I've lost my smell. And my niece says, I was having her put oregano oil on the bottom of her feet every three hours. And she said, my, her husband walked in and was like, oh, it's like Mama Celeste's like kitchen, like our house, she's so, and she was like, I couldn't even smell it. That's how her sense of smell had left. And so um, it's really interesting that, that that's interesting. Let's see if anything else. Well, there, there is also, because people lose their taste mm -hmm. and death, is described as you taste death. You know, those who are, some among you will not taste of death until you see the kingdom. And so the, the smell has to do with truth and judgment. And then the taste has to do with death or it can on one side of the coin. So yes. we, you can tell we are in a close proximity to pretty active spiritual zones right now. Very close, very, very close. Let's see, I think I have a, that's it. You know, I have a, does that Keisha? Oh, <laughs> we have a, uh, uh, I, interesting, we did a poll right when we first started. I had asked if, was this the first time hearing you, Dr. Alwine, was this their first time? And it was, we're almost split, 54 no and the 43%, yes, 44% no, I'm sorry, 56% no, 44% yes. So what a great introduction. If um, I, I can tell all of you, if you, I know you love, you've loved what you've heard, you can go to Amazon, the creation, her creation, creation gospel books, you have volumes one through five. Can you kind of tell us like what each volume is? Sure. Uh, workbook one is the foundation where we want everybody to start. And it, it gives you the basic paradigm I work with in most of the other workbooks. You're going to encounter this paradigm. And it's based on the seven days of creation and the deep prophecies embedded this is going to be the first mention of so many important principles of scripture embedded in the Hebrew language. Then we overlay it with the seven spirits of Adonai listed in Isaiah. Then we overlay the seven feasts. And then just for kicks and giggles, we overlay the seven assemblies of revelation so that you can see that it's all, all consistent. Once you learn the paradigm, you have it. Um, and then from there, it doesn't really matter which workbook you'd want to read next, because now you've got the fundamentals. Um, probably as much as I'm teaching on the rivers of Eden now, it, it'd probably be good. To, um, workbook two has a, a kind of an overview of it, but it's workbook five, volume one, that has in-depth study on the rivers of Eden, so that when I go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then I start moving in circles on you, you, you feel like you're still in the same place. <laughs> uh, I'm in workbook yeah. one. If anyone wants to know where I am, if that tells you where, where, where Charlie's hanging out. So, well, I am also in your, I have your workbook five as going through the Parsha. So I am going through each one at the same time. So I'm double dipping. Yeah. Workbook two is um, probably the deepest of them if not workbook four, workbook two has the seven abominations of the wicked lamp, which you need to understand, understand what's happening in the book of Revelation. Then it has an examination of the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. We just stay on the sevens so that you can see everything's consistent and so timely right now. I didn't realize when I did the revision a couple of years ago how relevant it would be this year, this past year. And so you can literally see these horses riding out uh, once you understand what they are and how they work, you can see them riding out and we know what's coming next. Uh, 
workbook three is the spirit-filled family. We cover biblical principles for spirit-filled husbands, spirit-filled wives, spirit-filled children, and even spirit-filled singles. We don't want to leave them out because whether they're, you know, a grandma or a grandpa who's now widowed, or whether it's a young person looking for a spouse, or maybe even not looking at this point, maybe just relying on Adonai to provide that. The same principles need to be in place. Um, workbook four is the Scarlet Harlot and the Crimson Thread, which ladies, you will love it. Um, and it, it, it builds so much uh, with workbook two. They're, they're really twins. And then workbook five is in five volumes. There's one for each book of the Torah. And that's just to provide you with some study material each week on the Torah portion. Um, and you can use them multiple years because there's a bunch of stuff in there. You could just take one section. Yeah. Book six is on Hebrew prayer. And it's a good companion to the first book I ever wrote, which was Standing with Israel. And it's on the Amidah, the Hebrew standing prayer that Cornelius would have prayed. Um, and this would have been how the early believers, Jew or Gentile, they would have prayed according to this pattern and miraculous things happened. Um, and then the Becky books, we call them more like beginner books, which the last couple I've done really aren't beginner books, but um, there may be one level up. Like 50,000 degrees and cloudy is on the resurrection of the dead. What, what does that look like now? What does it look like post-mortem? Um, and we don't know because we've not been dead yet, but all we can do is collect what scripture has to say about it and maybe put it together with some of the insights of the rabbis into the language of those passages. And uh, it, I think it's a great comfort because I don't know about you guys, but people are dropping right and left in my life. And it's COVID has something to do with it, but it's just like, this is a season of death. It's, I say he's picking the roses and he's transplanting them into the garden. They're not that far away, but we missed them. And so I think it does bring comfort to read about the resurrection and the experience our loved ones are having right now while they wait for us. Uh, because see, they can't move on with their resurrected body. They won't get one until the last believer comes in and then everybody at the same time. Uh, but their experience right now is still extremely pleasant uh, compared to anything we're going through right now, for sure. But there's, have, there's just different titles you can go through on the Becky books. You have, they're, and they're great. And we do have, I, I've shared with a lot of you, if you can still get uh, Dr. Robin Gould, she'll be speaking on Thursday and her Becky book on marriage and remarriage in is a Becky book. And if you go into uh, Amazon and grab it, most likely you can get it before she, before Thursday night so that you have it. Cause she's pretty much going to take you just through her book. And I really feel like that's something that you should get one, get two, get one for you and one to share. Um, we do have some questions if you still have time. Sure. Uh, I have a question. What is Dr. Alwine's thoughts on Eden being the first temple? On, on what? On Eden being the first temple. I don't know about it being the first temple, but it's absolutely uh, a proto-prophecy of Israel because as you go through those rivers of Eden, and again, that's why that's like the longest chapter in any book I've ever written is, is the rivers of Eden, because as you break down the, the rivers, the stones, the names, the place names like Havila or Kush, the, everything has a context and everything is pointing to the temple. And so whether it was a literal temple, you know, like Moses, had the pattern of the tabernacle, he saw something. And then David was given the pattern of the temple. They weren't identical. Um, but I don't know at this point if I can really worry my pretty little head about it. 
<laughs> because it's hard enough to get, you know, the, the little pavers that I'm using right now. Um, but it's, it's possible because we do see proto prophecies of it. Mm -hmm. There, there was something there that did speak not only to the temple, but it spoke very specifically to the priesthood. That's good. We have Ginger says she wants to let you know that I was introduced to the whole idea of keeping Torah by listening to Dr. Alwine's creation gospel videos on HRN. So much has transpired since that time four years ago that I just want to say a huge thank you, all caps, lots of other teachers since then, but you were my first that peaked and it peaked my interest. Um, Diana Brown on Facebook, it says, when we crossed over to the upper garden, Yeshua, Jesus, said we would be like the angels, neither marrying nor being given in marriage. How will this change when the upper garden descends? Marriage after Revelations 19, question mark. Part of what he's talking about, you, you almost get into an angel study to unpack it and, and I don't I can't tell you exactly what he meant I, I think it's a little obscure but when you study the particular kinds of angels that humankind has had interactions with there's different classes of annual angels um, this one particular class of angel they are called the ishim and you can hear in ishim the word for man ish but they're not human beings. They are human-like in appearance should they choose to reveal themselves. They will have a very human-like appearance. Um, the plural of ish, which is a, a man, a person, is anashim. So when we say ishim, we're not saying they're men. We are saying, I don't want to say humanoid either because that sounds way too sci-fi. <laughs> But they do have a, to us, a human-like appearance, which to them, maybe we have an angel-like appearance. Um, but the thing to remember about an angel is it's really given one task. They're, they're not really required to multitask. They have specific domains and they know those boundaries. And, you know, as, as long as we're talking about the good angels, the righteous angels, not the fallen angels, they're very on task. And if, if you have an encounter with one of these, because I think some of us, you know, he says you might've encountered one unawares or maybe you were aware. My mom had an encounter with one that pulled her car out of a blizzard, out of a ditch in a blizzard in Northern Oklahoma, physically pulled the car out and put it back on the road. And uh, when she looked back, you know, and the, the, the man told her, once I get you up on the road, just give it a little bit of gas and keep going and don't look back. Don't veer off the road. But she looked back anyway. <laughs> and there was nobody there. There was no car. There was no person. There was no nothing. And had she been in that ditch, she was going to an Air Force base and they had shut it down for the blizzard. She probably wouldn't have been found for a while. It was a miracle. Uh, but encounters with these sorts of angels, the Ishim, you might think it's a human being because that's the appearance that it has, um, but they're very task oriented. And if you try to take it off task with something, if you try to change the subject or redirect them, they're not going to pay any attention to you. That's, they're very single minded, if we want to use that term. I don't know if they have minds like we do but they're very one task oriented. They go to do that task and they don't play games. Once they do what they do, then they go on to the next thing. Um, but uh, I, I think in that respect, maybe that what, that's what Yeshua is hinting to. We will be like the angels in terms of understanding our role. And we will have jobs to do just like in the garden. And that, that might be what he's introducing. There is a, a heightened sense of mission and role like the angels and less a sense of let me cook supper for my husband. Like Yeshua told uh, 
Martha, he said, Mary's chosen the better thing here. She's, she's kind of chosen an angel thing here. <laughs> she's very single-minded in what she wants to accomplish. She wants to listen to the word and prepare herself for what's coming next. And it's not that preparing food for your spouse is a bad thing, but when he gives us a mission to do, everything else is secondary. We have, I'm going to do one, one last question here and, and we'll let you go. Uh, from Dolores Pompa on Facebook. Um, this is a question. She says, this will be good for a lot of, especially our new, new listeners. Uh, what is the meaning of the sevens? You, you were talking about workbook one. She said, what's the meaning of the sevens? And, and um, what's the meaning of number seven? She just repeated that. What is the meaning of the sevens? Well, it's it's a workbook full of information. Right, on the I was going to say that's a that's a loaded <laughs> question and a whole workbook about it. Yeah, because it, it pretty much extends from the beginning of the Bible to the end, because the Book of Revelation is all about the sevens. So we start with sevens and we end with sevens. In a nutshell, seven is completion, but it's also rest, and that's what people miss about the Book of Revelation. It's it's showing you how we are returned to rest. Uh, we tend to focus on 666, but the overriding and overarching theme of Revelation is seven. And even though it comes through tribulation, the whole point is to rest. That's all he's ever wanted us to do, was to accept him as the creator of the universe and the sovereign. And the way that we proclaim that is through resting from the creation on his Sabbath day. And that tells us there's nothing we can add in terms of creation. We can make things out of what he's already prepared, but we will never create anything. And in terms of the work of Yeshua, what are we going to add to his work of salvation? Really, what... All we can do on the first Sabbath is rest in what he's created. And that's a beautiful picture and it's a great motivation, you know, in, in terms of making that space of time on Shabbat to, to rest according to the scriptures. Because no matter what the world tells us we need to do on the seventh day, the creator hasn't changed his mind as to what will refresh us. And if we will, you know, obey his word, not just on the seventh day, but it's a great place to start. Then we might find refreshing flowing through our lives. I think I get asked all the questions often. It's like, how do you do everything? I'm like, because I rest one day a week. I shut down for 24 hours and it'd be shocking how much more I get done than I did before I honored a Shabbat. Now it's my favorite day. I, I, every day I said, is it Shabbat yet? And my husband says one day closer. <laughs> okay. So we've, we've talked about the workbooks. We've gone through those. Everyone, we know that you can actually go to creation gospel dot, is it com or dot org? Um, the, the creation gospel dot com dot com you can purchase them on there you can also purchase them on on amazon if that's easier for wherever you can find it again knowing that all the proceeds are going to um, help fund the orphanage right now in africa if you want to you can also email uh when well, you can go onto the website and you can uh, you can send an email and you can ask doc, dr alwine where's the next where you can plug into a creation gospel class i know i just started one a, a last week and so um it's fun you can jump into a class and actually go through it with other people go through the book have a teacher ask questions um, and she has those set up for you um, creation gospel on youtube you can go to the, her youtube channel catch up on creation gospel um, there oh my gosh there's so many ways to follow you go in and i promise you will you, that you're downloading things to your youtube channel every shabbat i open it and it's part of like the shabbat ritual it's like oh geez there's like a ton more here now i'm never gonna rest i'm gonna be watching my husband's like are you gonna sleep ever i'm like no i have too much to watch and then i have something that i don't even know if you know um i know you know about it but i don't know if you know the other part part b is um i know that you're writing a book for a conference coming up at the end of february or it is written and it's in the process and so what 
most of the ladies here don't know is that we have been asked, the Rudy Cafe has been asked by the women in South Africa if we would sponsor the United States women and the women in England, if we would, or in Europe, if we would sponsor, be able to host that event and be able to manage it from this side of the pond and even on the other side. But if we would be able to manage that and partner with them in having that same, and it's actually your Purim conference that you have coming up. Do you want yeah. to share a teeny bit about that? Or? Sure. Years ago, um, I put together pretty much in a week's time. It was one of those things that just, it had to have been the spirit because it, on my own, it would have taken me forever to research it and get it, get it down. But we did a kind of a miniature workbook on Esther, identifying, identifying the entire story of Joseph is in the, the scroll of Esther. The entire story is in there. It's embedded. It's encoded. And there's a whole unfolding story there that explains, I think, what we're doing right now how these, these children, that the promise given to Sarah, you will be the mother of many nations. She died at age 127. And Queen Esther was the queen mother to 127 provinces. And so we can see the, the prophecy being handed down here through the, the females on the one side, and then the males on the, it's just like a mirror. The, the story of Joseph and the scroll of Esther are mirrors of one another, but it really does explain where we are today in terms of Sarah being our mother, which Paul tried to teach us. Um, you know, she, Sarah is Jerusalem above, the one we've been talking about, the, the spiritual aspect of the Torah, not the letter of it devoid of the spirit, because you'll very quickly fall back into bad behavior. But if you allow the spirit, if you allow those living waters to flow through the word, and now you've got the testimony of Yeshua and the Holy Spirit that he was talking about in John, and you have the commandments of God and they're flowing through those commandments, then you have the only two weapons that are needed to scare the heck out of the beast and the dragon because they got no defense. Those two think they have no defense to that. And so this is part of that unfolding prophecy and we never published it formally it's always been like a uh, hrn hebraic roots network has printed them off their copy machine and if you know they're out there you can ask for them but i never migrated it into a published book and so i've done that now i've i've done some editing and some revising um, and so we're hoping that at least the Kindle version could be ready by the Purim conference. And um, since I was in such an inspired revision mode, I went ahead and what you're hearing tonight is just one of, I believe, nine chapters in a book I'm working on or trying to finish up right now called 144,000 Harps. Um, so many places in the Torah portions are prophesying exactly what we see in the book of Revelation. And it's it's not teaching you new things. It's just connecting for you what you already know and showing you that, hey, look, look at this text. It's the same as what John saw. Look at this text. It's the same as what John's telling you. And so we've got the Purim conference coming up. We've got the Esther book. It's going to be because of publishing, copyrights, and so forth. <laughs> it's funny how they tell you what you can do with your own material, but the American version will be Esther, Mysteries Behind the Mask, and then the version that's published in South Africa will be Esther, uh, Prophecies Behind the Veil. They'll, they'll have to be different, formatted differently, and a little, there have to be some significant things done so that I'm not publishing an identical book, which Amazon, i.e. KDP would, um, remove my worldwide distribution. So we well, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. And for the ladies, when we get start posting about it, it's going to be amazing. You're not just going to be able to go through this new publication with Dr. Alwine, but there'll be, it's a, there'll be a whole training on biblical oils. I know Keisha's participating. 
I'm so excited. I can't wait to go. So I have to, we have to hurry up and get this ready so people can start registering. I, I said, you give me till after this conference, please. And then we'll put it together when we can actually start taking registrations. It will be, uh, there will be a cost involved. We're not sure quite yet because it will include uh, some oils that will be sent to you. So I know that, that we're working, working with our American counterparts to be able to send out here. We have to orchestrate the logistics. So thank you for all of you praying in advance for that. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to attend and um, thank you for being here. Thank you for letting us partner with you because I know you're doing great things in Africa and thank you for letting us partner with you to, to help make that happen. Yeah, because I, I think there's things we can do in the future. You know, it's right now more than ever, families stuck in houses with each other and they, it's like they don't like each other very much after a few days. But I've, I'd love to do the Spirit-Filled Family Seminar, which I haven't done in years. And uh, I, I just think right now, I don't want people to be afraid of the beast and his systems. He's worked his way into every conceivable system that we would lean upon or trust in. And the truth is, the stronger the beast looks, the closer he is to breaking and, and that's what I tried to tell the students, I think last night in class, is when Yeshua stood before Pontius Pilate, he was beaten, he was whipped, he had a crown of thorns on his head, his beard had been plucked out, he was mocked, he was spit upon, and at that moment, if we could have looked at Yeshua we would have said, this is the smallest, weakest, most insignificant human being on earth. And Rome is the power. Hmm. That's what your eyes would have told you. But the spirit would have told you the decision that this person has made has become the decline of the beast. No matter what your eyes see right now, this is the most powerful man that will ever live on earth. He looks the smallest and the weakest. And that's the way we feel sometimes. We feel like the smallest, the weakest, the mocked, the spit upon, the disdained. But that's the sign that the clock is ticking on the dragon and the beast. And they know their time is short because those two things, the testimony of Yeshua, the commandments of God, that's evidence that Israel is on the rise. Yes. And if Israel is rising, no matter what you see, you got to know that the power that is in you is the same power that resurrected Yeshua from the dead. Hmm. And all the beast and the dragon can do from this point on is fall repeatedly. And, and you just have that confidence. And I think networking together is the key because if the beast owns Amazon, if the beast owns Facebook, if the beast owns the healthcare system, if the beast owns politics, if the beast owns our guns, Anything we might have been clutching with our fingers so hard, afraid to give up. Oh, no, no, no. Please don't take that away from me. I have rights. I'm an American. I have rights. I have the Constitution. I have the flag. And he's like, <laughs> I'm prying your fingers off of those things so you'll hold on to me. Yes. He wants to carry us across that threshold of the Jordan. He wants to take us across. But as long as we're clinging to those flagpoles, and I'm pro-flag, pro-American, pro-Constitution, but we got to be like it was in the time of Queen Esther, where Haman goes to the king and says, these people that live among you, it doesn't matter if they're peaceful people, they have their own laws. And that's not acceptable. We are a people, we have our own law. Mm -hmm. We have the word of Adonai. So yeah, we're going to stick out. But what a great deliverance we're going to be a part of. So networking with one another, the beast will just run you from one platform to the other. Right. That's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Like you said, we're going to stay in contact and we're going to get more and more human contact. That's what these electronic media 
digital platforms can do. These people we see on a video can actually become real faces in our lives if we let them and we be, allow them to network us. So thank you for being part of that and being a source of comfort for people who are feeling very disconnected right now. I encourage all of you too, if you're in the portion, if you're over in the Facebook or you guys jump over on in the portion, look at the, there's a map we have there and we've asked you to pin it. I've prayed, I prayed, Father, how is there is a way for everyone to see where everyone's from? And I saw someone just, of course this happens, right? A, it popped up recommended places and I thought, oh, we can use that. And so you hit recommended places, but you're just going to put your city in there. I don't care if you put like your favorite restaurant, it doesn't, really, but what'll happen then is that pin will be all over the world, wherever you are. So what it's allowed me to do in my, in, for selfish reasons, I can skim in now. I can be like, oh, I'm in North Little Rock right now. And I've already, I've already been able to reach and physically touch three of you that I've never met before and be able to touch you. And I have several others before I leave here, I'll get to connect. I'm looking what's next. What's in, what's in Tennessee where I'm going? Who's, who's close to me there? Who's going to be in South Carolina when I go there? I can go and see now where as we're traveling, who do I get to connect with? And I want you to do the same. Look in there. Who's near me and reach out and touch each other. I know one of the things in our guides as the women come into as members in our cafe, we're having our guides connect you with two or three other women so that you're not alone. Because ladies, that's what he wants to divide. He wants to isolate, right? That's what the that's what any in it. Let's get the limping ones. Let's get them isolated. And we're not going to let you get isolated. We want to pull you in and hold you tight. And so thank you. Thank you for all being here. Thank you. I, I want to go back to the fragrance of Messiah. That's one of our core values is everything that happens in here. We want to make sure as we leave that we've left the fragrance of Messiah. If our words with over each other between each other we may not have agreed on something but we've left the fragrance of messiah because what we want is that we want it, it to be it went to whatever we're saying to rise up in our community whether it's online digitally or when we get to meet in person we get to be not like we tease and say not like the torah taliban or the terrorists and some of the other groups where they're fighting over silly things and instead of being a place of shalom, being a place of unity, a had, being a place where that fragrance is just wafting up and he is saying, well done ladies, well done. So thank all of you for loving each other so much. And thank you, Miss Dr. Halisa Alawine for being with us tonight. We are blessed again and can't wait to see you the end of February. I might be seeing you sooner, but we'll see. <laughs> That'll be great. And I, can, I can teach you the Razorback fight song, right? That's, oh, geez. Yeah. Well, as soon as COVID is over, we're getting her, we'll, we'll get her to Texarkana and I know I'll see you there. <laughs> blessings to all of you. We just pray blessings over all of you and we will see you tomorrow night at the same time. Uh, we will be meeting with Miss Deborah Flanagan. Miss Deborah Flanagan, unmute yourself and say, hey, before we go out. Well, hello. What another wonderful evening this was, right? <laughs> Right. Are they, are we, are we all getting ready to get your fingers all up in our pudding tomorrow? Oh, it's yeah. <laughs> I've already had his, his fingers in mine. So it might as well, what, what's good for me is good for everybody else. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. We appreciate you sharing what he's not just do, in doing in your life, but what you're going to end up speaking over our lives. So I, I'm a little afraid. Can I be honest? What, now what's the title of your talk again for tomorrow? Um, it is, um, uh, Delilah's regret, uh, Abigail's threat, a mindset. And we're going to look at a, just a few uh, relational issues that the those women had, and uh, you know what, how we can relate to that. <laughs> so it's going to be, be good. It's going to yeah. be good. I get to see you soon, and I'm going to crack up right now. I see Halisa's her icon, her picture. If you saw my dog, my dog down here looks just like that, but without the sunglasses. So, and well, usually, it wouldn't be boring. a teaching from Halisa unless we could hear the dog in the background. That's my right part about her teachings. I have to put my dog in the other room because she snores just as loud. But all of you, yeah. be blessed. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, thank you, Brenda. Say hello. Brenda's on here. We can't can't have can't leave without saying hi to Miss Brenda. Hello, everyone. So nice to be here what a blessing this was it was I'm gonna I'm gonna just put now Brenda and I co-host Fridays and so mm -hmm. I we promise you'll laugh and you you probably will cry I don't know it could happen it could right? happen yes <laughs> but we promise to love you we will we will love you yes we will what a great night it was oh such a blessing 
We are blessed. Well, all of you have a wonderful night. Get some good sleep and some good rest. Uh, we will be putting out the uh, PowerPoint. We'll post it in there. We'll make sure we eat. You'll get it in all the ways. And if you mm -hmm. haven't gotten it by tomorrow, you can email us and we'll make sure we email it to you. But let's let us try to post it first so so we don't make our poor office girls crazy trying to ship that out all over the place. We are virtual. You guys, if you just knew my team, can I just say a shout out to this whole team? I mean, all the women that have been working together, I'm more blessed. Again, you have women praying over you. Yes. We have a team of prayer partners right now, women of all ages that are just sitting at home and they may not be tech savvy, but they can pray. Girls, we got some prayer warriors who are praying over each and every one of you, praying yes. over our speakers, praying over leaders. And I just want you to know they're covering you, covering you, covering you in prayer. Yeah. And I think we have our team that it's in, in all the places, whether they're in the email section, whether they're over in Facebook, everyone's answering questions to make sure you feel loved and you're connected. They're all jumping in there. Um, no, every, pretty much everyone's volunteers. So I don't yeah. even know why you do it. So just thank you all. <laughs> Thanks for being on my crazy train. I love you all so much. We couldn't do any of this without any of you. So thank you. Thank right. you to all of you for, thank you for, I just, I'm just blessed. So blessings to all of you. We will see you tomorrow night. We'll see you join tomorrow night. Yes. Join us early for mm -hmm. worship. Shalom y'all. Shalom.